Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming to today's event, our conversation with the Information Commissioner, Elizabeth Denham, CBE. I'm Gavin Freegard, Programme Director and Head of Data and Transparency here at the Institute for Government, and I'm delighted that today, on Valentine's Day, so many of you have decided to make a lunch date with data. <laughs> And of course, with us. Um, though, of course, here at the Institute, we love data every day of the year. Uh, some housekeeping first. If you'd like to share the love, we will be tweeting um, at the hashtag IFG Denim. And we're also live tweeting from at IFG Events. You can also see behind me the Information Commissioner's Office are on at ICO News. Those of you in the room can get onto the Wi Fi using the details behind me on the slide. That's the IFG Guest Network. Uh, username is IFG, password is visitor, all lowercase. And we're also live streaming, so hello to those of you not in the room today. Uh, today's event is on the record. So many of the most pressing political issues that we face are about information, data, the way it's created, shared, accessed, analysed and used. Whether it's the use of personal data in political campaigns, something the ICO has been very focused on recently, whether it's what social media companies are recording about us, how government departments use our personal data, what future technologies might do to society and the state, GDPR, FOI, AI, and so much more. And of course, what Brexit might mean for a lot of that, and how data is shared across borders. So government and private companies have more data than ever before. There are more government and civil society organisations dealing with questions of information regulation and data ethics than ever before. And one of the key organisations in that increasingly complex ecosystem is the Information Commissioner's Office, or ICO, the UK's independent authority set up to uphold information rights in the public interest, both promoting openness by public bodies and data privacy for individuals. Elizabeth Denham, CBE, was appointed Information Commissioner in July 2016. She was previously Information and Privacy Commissioner for British Columbia in Canada and Assistant Privacy Commissioner for Canada. She's also the Chair of the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners, the leading global forum of data protection and privacy authorities, and is also a visiting professor at University College London and their Department of Information Studies. So Elizabeth is going to give some prepared remarks for six or seven minutes about some of those many big issues that we're facing. Uh, she and I will then carry on the conversation for 20 minutes or so, and then we'll throw it open to all of you for questions, wrapping up at about half past one. So without further ado, Elizabeth. Thank you, Gavin, and thanks to all of you for coming this afternoon. And I'm really looking forward, especially to the Q&A session, to um, find out what is keeping you up at night when it comes to data and information. So thanks, Gavin, and thanks to the IFG for this invitation. Um, my staff have been um, working uh, with me on this event for, for quite some months and, and getting the, the date in the diary. So it's really important, and it's my first time um, speaking at an IFG event, although I recognize many faces in, in the crowd. So I've, I've seen you in other places and other events. So the IFG's work on highlighting the practical challenges of public administration in the UK is second to none. And I'm indebted to the Institute for its work, um, and yours in particular, Gavin, as you are in the same corner as us, and it's comforting to have you in our corner working with us and flying the flag of transparency and openness in government. So I'm just going to kick off um, with some prepared remarks about my role and about some of the priority issues that are on my desk right now. So I'm Information Commissioner of the UK, and in that role, I regulate a whole range of information rights, everything from direct marketing to the oversight of the disclosure of environmental information. But my office is chiefly known for our oversight of data protection and privacy and also our work in adjudicating freedom of information requests. So in both of those areas, I not only handle complaints from individuals and also have the capacity to take on own motion investigations, 
but also we issue best practice guidance to breathe some life into the statutes. We also take action against organizations, everything from an audit of personal information handling practices or a monitoring program to oversee the timeliness of FOI responses. And since I came to the, the UK in that magic month right after the referendum of July 2016, um, I've been looking around at other regulators and I think it would be really tough to see, to find a regulator that has quite the breadth of the remit of the ICO. Also, it used to be a relatively sleepy area of law, freedom of information and data protection, but now information rights are an essential plank of modern democracies. It's all about trust and confidence that people have in government institutions. So simply put, freedom of information and data protection support the legitimacy of public administration. When I think about the public sector, I think the greatest transformation in that sector in the last 10 years has been the growth of digital public services. So everything from tax applications to benefit claims to procurement portals and dare I say applications for UK settled status. Key public services used by millions of us every day increase the amount of information that's held by public bodies. Information about their work, about public bodies work, but also information about us held by public bodies to service us as citizens and tailor our experience. And that's just the public sector side. Data is at the heart of almost everything that we do in our commercial life and in our personal life. Tech companies now know more about us, their users, than any traditional brick and mortar company could ever have dreamed of knowing. And that information, that information that they hold about us is increasingly used to personalize our experience of the services we're using, but also to predict our futures and nudge us towards certain outcomes. So big data government, big data commerce, and big data influencing is changing the way that we live our lives and some people say is undermining our rights and our democracies. And we've been quietly talking about this for a really long time but suddenly it feels like everybody is talking about this. I've given evidence to Parliament more than a dozen times and not just talking about issues of data protection, but on wider issues that have data at their heart. Data ethics, the deployment of AI in the UK, the security implications of Brexit, algorithmic decision making, fake news, and disinformation. So you can't discuss these issues or have an informed consideration of policy direction without taking data protection into account. So personal data and its regulation are indivisible from these conversations. And, and that's a really big challenge for us. That's a really big challenge for, for my office because public expectations are so high and we've got to keep our eye on many developing policy debates and conversations where data use arises. So that's our challenge as a cross-sectoral regulator and it's also though our greatest opportunity. I will take action whenever and wherever data obligations are disregarded. So the problem that keeps me up at night, besides losing my papers, 
is how do, we leave up, how do we actually live up to that challenge? At a time when the underlying law has changed, so GDPR has, seen, has given us the greatest change in law in a generation, and when the public are demanding more from our office than they ever have in the past. And so what I feel like we've done in the last year, it feels a lot like changing tires on a moving car. And that moving car is speeding around a roundabout. So fortunately for us, government and parliament recognized that we needed, the ICO needed to be a fit for purpose digital regulator. So last year we were given a new funding model that provides increased resources for our data protection work. And I think as many of you in this audience know, the ICO laid its first report to Parliament in over a decade, and we laid that report um, before Parliament in January. It's a, a crucial report at a crucial time for public services. And we're calling in that report for a host of vital measures to address the transparency gap created by so many public services delivered by the private sector. And as the Institute knows, this is not a small issue. Private providers of public services are responsible for billions of dollars in government contracts. So names like MITE and G4S, BT, and of course, the collapsed Carillion. So I'm going to talk a bit more in our conversation about our recommendations in that report, but right now we're waiting for a government response and its recommendations. And I'm hopeful that some of you here today in the audience will be allies of the ICO and, and allies of the Institute in pushing for those recommendations in our report. And this will include the need for parliamentary time to debate the report and the changes that we're calling to both in law but also in practice. The Public Accounts Committee and the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee are the most obvious conduits to drive the agenda forward. But I'm also going to continue to advocate to see this issue picked up as a formal inquiry. At present, information about how a third of all of our public services are delivered is not legally accessible under FOI. And I can't see how letting this situation persist is either good public administration or indeed sustainable in a modern democratic society. So thanks for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Elizabeth. I mean, let's, should we start with the sort of outsourcing oversight question? Because as you say, um, this is something the Institute has long been interested. Here is our recent report on government procurement and why we need better data and better information about how a third of public money is spent. Um, I mean, you mentioned that this is the first um, ICO report in over a decade to be laid before Parliament. I mean, it clearly highlights its importance to you and the ICO. Government hasn't necessarily been pressing to make changes in this space in recent years. What do you think could change that and why will this time be different? This, it feels like a different time and although many stakeholders, civil society, academic groups and parliamentarians have raised this issue before, it feels like the time is right to really have this debate in Parliament. And I think two major public issues the collapse of Carillion with its 420 public sector contracts and the lack of accessibility, but also the Grenfell fire, um, which was, Grenfell um, was the subject, it is a subject of an inquiry, but also cases and complaints were brought to our office against the Tenant Management Association of the Grenfell Tower, and my hands were tied there was no way that we could pursue or oversee FOI complaints because TMOs are not subject to the Freedom of Information Act. So I think that 
I think we've got a couple of really major public issues. We've also done significant research and case studies about many requests that we've been frustrated in following up because the Act doesn't extend to private providers in most situations. So the time is now. I think we have a lot of people actually in our corner. We have parliamentarians that are really interested in debating this. So I'm going to continue to advocate for this uh, extension of the law. And do you think there will be any other challenges apart from however government feels? For instance, we, we hear a lot that some of the big outsourcing companies are very positive about um, opening up themselves to being covered by FOI. But do you think that's how it will work in practice? Are there particular technical issues? So again, one of the other sort of challenges that's often put forward is that sort of smaller charities, smaller companies who might then be subject to FOI might be too small to be able to deal with it properly. Right. And um, how, how do you see the sort of way through that? Well, in, um, in the research and the investigations that we did to compile the report, we spoke to most of the major suppliers of public services and we didn't get a lot of pushback from the big players arguably because they have the capacity to be able to respond to FOI requests and some of them have good transparency voluntary transparency measures in place now so I think they understand that there is an expectation of more transparency if they're delivering um, public services and the large expenditure over 100 million um, pounds for many of these strategic suppliers. When it comes to small charities and small organizations, we faced some of these same challenges for even parish councils that, are, that have to comply with data protection legislation. So we have some of the smallest organizations that have to comply with data protection because it is a fundamental right. I think um, government obviously has to consult with these agencies and look at whether or not there needs to be a threshold in terms of the size of a contract or the type of public service that's delivered. But it can't just be about money because some very small agencies are delivering services that really matter to people's lives. The, the care of aging parents in a care home or the provision of housing for families and I think there needs to be equity in access. So government obviously has to do some consultation before designation orders or changing the law, but we think that we've provided a roadmap to get there in our report. And obviously the sort of changes that you've proposed would open some of those organizations up to being FOI'd. Do you think it would have a wider, or should it have a wider impact on their organisational culture and the way that some of this data is recorded, some of the way decisions are recorded by sort of outsourced <coughs> providers? Right. More scrutiny equals better public services. So I think we've come to realise that in the, the creation of the Act and the impact that the Act has had in the last 15 years in the UK. So I think FOI for, the, for public bodies has become like it's like cancer, it's an accountability mechanism, it's, it's just become part of the background. And so our case is for extending it beyond there. And the impact that it could have besides opening up the delivery and the quality and the effectiveness of these services to scrutiny and therefore improve public services, it would also create the kind of data that researchers need and it might even le level the playing field to bring new players in to public service delivery. And I think that's been the point of the, the IFG um, in this space. And on, on the subject of some of the IFG's work around FOI, so moving it away from those who might in future be covered by it and going back to those who are currently covered by it, I mean, our research has shown that government departments have become much more withholding informa in the information they release in response to FOI requests. I think more than half of all requests since the middle of 2015, some information or all the information is withheld in full by departments. I know the BBC as well has done quite a lot of um, research about it taking much longer to get information out of departments. I think they give some examples of the Home Office taking um, more than two years in seven cases to deal with something which should be handled in sort of 20 working days. How is the sort of regulator responsible? Do you intend to sort of change that? The sort of that sort of opacity and the sort of less timely delivery of information. 
I think after 15 years of experience that, that this country has had in FOI, I think we are seeing slippage in terms of timeliness and even the quality of responses. So we have, um, for the first time, sent out for consultation um, an FOI strategy. And in that strategy, it indicates our intention to enforce the law more stringently, to increase the kind of monitoring and the threshold for monitoring and audits that we undertake, um, as well as looking at a report card <coughs> system for those central government departments that are dragging their feet or lagging behind the standard. So you will see an increase in enforcement. Last year, um, we issued an enforcement notice to the MOJ, the Ministry of Justice, so that they could, that they were required to speed up their responses. <coughs> and we will use that tool again for other central government departments. There are other reasons, I think, for the higher statistic in um, the percentage of requests that are not that are withheld or at least partly or in full and i think that's because there are fewer resources in the departments assigned to freedom of information i think that's particularly the case during this year of of brexit so you see more and more staff that are moved into other areas but also there are more requests for sensitive information i think relating to brexit that can be legitimately withheld for international relations or the negotiating position of the government. So I think there are some reasons for that, but as a regulator, um, it's too slow, it's taking too much time, and we're stepping up our, our response. Excellent. Um, and there's much more about sort of freedom of information statistics on the Institute for Government website, so shameless plug there uh, on our behalf. Um, there are so many subjects that, that we could cover before we throw it open to questions. Um, I wanted to touch on sort of personal data and GDPR in particular, which is, as you say, has sort of been quite a big change over the last year or so. I'm sure everybody's familiar with it, at least from all of those newsletter sign-ups that have been bombarding your inbox with getting you to sign up to revised conditions. Um, I mean, first of all, from a sort of public sector perspective, how do you think government organisations have responded to that sort of change in the strengthening of, of people's rights over their own data? I think government departments have got themselves over the line um, as of May 25th, 2018. So I think government departments have done the, the minimum work that they needed to do to ensure that they had the right legal basis for the collection use and sharing of personal data. They um, appointed their data protection officers, they took a look at their privacy notices. So I think they did, government departments did the, the first steps of compliance. But this is not, the GDPR is not Y2K for data protection. So getting over the mark doesn't actually get you all the way there. And I think what government departments have to do now is ensure that they keep their, their foot on, on, the, on, the, on the pedal because they haven't done the work that needs to be done for the accountability requirements of the Act. So the, all the processes that need to be in place to ensure privacy by design, data protection impact assessments, the risk management, the audits that need to be sent to their audit function or the board. So I think, I think there's much more to be done um, in public bodies and I am concerned about the level of resources that have put, been put into data protection. We are, um, we're involved in looking at a number of uh, technology, new implementation of technologies in the policing um, sector, in the justice sector. So I was telling Gavin before we came um, on stage that we've got an investigation into the use of facial recognition technology by police services. We're looking at the extraction of uh, mobile uh, data by police services. We just um, issued an enforcement notice a few months ago to the Metropolitan Police for their gangs met a matrix. So we're, we are doing more enforcement in, in the public sector. We're looking at the HMRC voice print. So in order for government departments to comply, they have to do more than privacy notices and ensuring that they have the right process in place. They actually have to look at how they're managing data and especially how they're implementing new technology including biometrics. 
So that's the public sector. In terms of the private sector, I think a lot of the coverage when GDPR was introduced was around the rather large fines that the ICO might be able to impose if, if companies are found in breach. So I suppose the big question is, can we expect any big fines coming down the, down the line and what impact do you think that will have on compliance across the sort of sector? So in um, GDPR, um, all of the big headlines were about the fines, so that now instead of 500,000 pounds, the ICO has up to 4% of global turnover, so it could be in the, the millions or billions of pounds for um, a large company. And yeah, they're great headline grabbers, fines are, but what the GDPR gives us is a whole range of regulatory tools, everything from a warning letter to a stop processing order. And I think a stop processing order against a large tech company could actually have a greater impact than a fine. We also have um, mandatory audits. We have the requirement for data breach notification, which takes us into looking at accountability and the responses of organizations. So I just want to remind you that there's a, there's a whole set of new tools that we have that we intend on using and not just find. That said, we do have some um, pretty big cases in the pipeline. We, many of the contraventions we were investigating occurred before May 25th, 2018. So we're, for those cases, we're still in, in the old regime. But in terms of the new cases that could be subject to the, the new level of fines, we do have three or four in the pipeline. So watch this space in the next few months. Excellent. Uh, obviously not for the companies concerned. <laughs> um. Any private sector companies in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> show of hands. Um, we'll come back to you all later on that. Um, so even in the last few weeks, actually, there's been a lot of discussion around particular types of sort of private sector companies, so social media companies, tech, uh, sort of tech companies in general. And we've seen in the last week, the Labour Party has called for sort of greater regulation. We've seen the Ken Cross review into the future of journalism also talk more about sort of codes of conduct and regulation of, of tech platforms. Where do you see the ICO fitting into those sorts of calls for greater regulation? I think there are a lot of voices in this space right now, as you said, um, Gavin, and I know the, the Telegraph has a, a campaign on the need for a duty of care for online platforms. And um, a lot of people are calling for internet regulation when really what's being discussed is, is, the re is increased regulation for online platforms. So that's really the, the focus of the conversation. When it comes to data protection, online platforms are already regulated. And as most of you in the room know, we have been overseeing adjudication for right to be forgotten for a very long time with Google and other online platforms. So when it comes to data protection, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Snap, all of these companies are already regulated by data protection. Where the gap is, is, the, is, is in user-generated content on online platforms. So illegal content is already illegal. But offensive content or user-generated content is arguably not. And I think that's where the discussion is, and it's also particularly focused on kids and keeping kids safe online. So where the ICO fits in is, as I said in my opening remarks, all the delivery of fake news and disinformation, the tracking of kids online, the, the kind of um, provocative content that's delivered to kids and people is determined by personal data and profiling. So you can't really take the ICO and data protection out of the online harms discussion. Where, <clears throat> what worries us, I think, what worries us um, in the regulatory community is a knee-jerk reaction to regulation that creates a chill on freedom of expression and um, free and fair elections that allow the kind of conversations that we need to have online. So this is going to be really hard, but that said, I think there is um, obviously political will and public interest, especially in protecting kids online. Our contribution in this space immediately is that under the Data Protection Act 2018, 
we're tasked with creating a code for age-appropriate design. So for kids' games and websites and any sites that are directed towards kids, we're working on a code that is going to dictate how companies implement privacy by design. So you'll see that we've consulted on that code and I think that can go, um, not all the way, but it, it can assist kids online in making sure that there's some safety and, and content is controlled for kids. So one final question before I throw it open to the audience. Um, I mean, you've already touched on this, that the sort of role and remit of your office has sort of expanded and changed quite a lot over the last few years, indeed, um, in the sort of nearly, well, two and a half years while, while you've been there. How have, how have you been sort of dealing with that, and where do you see the sort of ICO being in a couple of years' time to adapt to all of those changes and those new risks? I mentioned that um, we are fortunate that government and, government and parliament saw their way that we needed a new fee regime, we needed to be able to up our game in terms of technology expertise, working at the ICO. So since um, 2016, we've more than doubled in staff. Um, we've had a 60% increase in, in our budget, so we're really fortunate. And we've been able to really focus on hiring um, technologists. We've got an AI fellow who's helping us with um, algorithmic auditing. And we have a, a tech panel. So we've really expanded the capacity of the ICO. And I think that's really important at a time when there's so much expectation on us. So I can see our capacity continuing to grow. I think we'll reach 800 staff in, in 2020. But a, but a lot of what we needed to do is increase our capacity to understand technology, to be able to audit tech companies, to look under the bonnet, and to be able to understand how, how data is being used, especially when we think about AI, machine learning, and the Internet of Things, which is, which is right here. Not, not in the future, but right in front of us. Excellent, thank you. Um, so, I will now ask for questions from the audience. I'll probably take two or three at a time. Um, a reminder that we are on the record, and I'd normally just say we're on the record, so be aware that your name and sort of organisation will be known, but I feel like I should probably ask explicit consent from all of you uh, before, before we do that. Um, so, if you wait for a microphone to come to you, if you do give your name uh, where you're from, keep questions uh, relatively short so we can get through as many people as possible, and um, I'll take them in short groups. So, we'll start down the front here, then the row behind, and then the gentleman back there. Hi, I'm Emily Nicole from City I Am. Um, so based on your last statement just then, do you see the ICO as the auditor of tech firms? Is that kind of where you think you're heading? Obviously right now that applies to data protection, but <coughs> given that's the big topic, is how we regulate these big firms in ways they've never faced before, is that what you see the future of the ICO being? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Joe Dilger. I'm the Data Protection Officer, Freedom Information Officer Lead at University of Winchester. My question revolves around, uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned the importance of the accountability side, accountability mechanisms under GDPR. And uh, I also note uh, the recent uh, fine of approximately 50 million euros by uh, French Data Protection Authority, Canil, uh, for Google. Uh, quite a lot of that was revolving around their lack of uh, getting the correct legal bases in place. Uh, and my actual question is, do you and your staff believe that perhaps organisations in the UK have not, as of yet, paid enough attention to documenting the lawful bases for the processing purposes for the personal data that they use? Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Ian McGill from Spend Network. We actually produced some of the research for your report. So. Um, uh, and we worked with Gavin on the IFG report, and one of the things that both reports highlighted was the fact that there is a requirement to publish data automatically, so to publish your contract award notices, for example, and, and that's very different from FOI data. And I wondered whether there was uh, anything in your remit or in your plans to ensure that the routinely published data was going to be up to scratch, because otherwise you might be FOIing a company for their performance on a contract that you didn't actually know they had. <laughs> Thank you. I start, I'll start with um, your question first, because I think by extending the remit of FOI to those, those large 
contracted providers. Along with that would go the obligation for publication, the identification, the publication of data that's related to their public service delivery. So I, I see that as part and partial to extending the law. So not just for FOI requests, but also the requirement to um, in the publication scheme. So I see that a really important um, impact of extending the reach of FOI to these providers of, of public services. So that's the, the first question. Um, and in terms of the question about whether I saw the ICO as the, the main platform regulator or the auditor for the tech companies, we do have the ability to audit tech companies for their, their governance, their data government governance, and also their data protection practices. So we also have the ability under the GDPR to reach across borders, which no other regulator in the UK has right now. So we have the extra territorial reach to investigate companies that might be based outside of, of the EU and, and certainly in, the, in Silicon Valley. We've had the experience in doing that with Facebook in the, the Cambridge Analytica political campaigning investigation. So we have that ability now, it's limited to data protection. So the question about who is going to have their powers extended or whether a new regulator will be created to look at this content issue that I discussed earlier, that's one for, for government and parliament. But I think you can't take the data protection regulator out of the mix given the, the GDPR and personalization being really the center of a lot of these harms. And the, the question about accountability mechanism, the Keneal fine for 50 million against Google was really about um, a lack of appropriate consent in the ad tech um, space, the ecosystem. When I think about uh, what's happening in the UK, what I really want to push as a regulator is um, public bodies and private sector companies understanding what their accountability requirements are. Because I think that's where you're going to get real compliance and that's where people are going to see their rights protected. So those are the processes that need to be put in place to protect data. And I think a way into that is data breach notification. Because the first questions we're going to ask when a data breach is reported to us is, show us your accountability program. Show us, prove to us that this data breach wasn't just a one-off, but you actually have the rigor of data, good sound data governance in place. Because that's what the GDPR has, that's changed in the landscape from the, 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 uh, the regulation, from the directive. Thank you. Um, I'll take the lady in the second row, the lady behind, and then the other lady over there as well. My colleague, Jill. Just full disclosure. Thanks. My name's Kate, and I'm from The Sun newspaper. Um, obviously, the tech giants have been under the spotlight, particularly in the last few weeks, about the sort of content that their young users are receiving. I wondered, do you think that tech giants are living up to their moral responsibility for their users in terms of how they're handling data and content? And would you support a statutory duty of care? OK. The uh, row behind. Oh, sure. Hi, Becky Hill from the Register. Um, as of October, the ICO had spent 2.5 million on the Facebook and political um, democracy probe. And it's gained the ICO a lot of publicity as well as through the pursuit of the US citizen David Carroll's um, uh, case against SCL. So I wanted to know what you'd say to those who see it as having distracted and detracted from the other more day-to-day -day work that the ICO does in FOI enforcement and also in pursuing other data breach investigations. Thanks. And Jill. Hi, I'm Jill Rutter. I do Brexit at the Institute for Government, so I want to ask about Brexit. Uh, I said apologies for that. Uh, but uh, um, I think the UK in its, uh, its future partnership paper on data suggested that you should be sort of allowed to sit in the EU data regulators forum after Brexit. The UK would sort of pretty well maintain where EU regulation 
was. Now, I just wondered if you'd uh, like to comment, um, particularly since other Commonwealth countries see GDPR as sort of quite a Germanic approach to data, um, find it very difficult, particularly the sort of extraterritoriality you mentioned, whether you think that, uh, uh, two things, one, that the future of data regulation without a UK voice uh, as part of the decision-making process, like to go in a way that we all find increasingly uncomfortable after Brexit. And secondly, um, how do you actually see this arrangement of you having observer status working? And does it work while you have this sort of international chairmanship? And you, if your successor didn't have that, would they be likely be much less influential post-Brexit in uh, EU future data arrangements? Thanks for those really simple questions. <laughs> um, let's start with the, the question about tech giants and, and whether or not their, their actions are, are moral or morally sustainable. I think, I think that's the point, that these companies are so large, have so much power, um, and how there's um, even a disincentive for other, other smaller companies to compete because of their, their data stacks and their data stores. I think what's technically possible and sometimes even legal is not morally sustainable um, in our society. And I think that's really what the discussion is about right now. And that's why data ethics and digital ethics as well as compliance with the law have to come together. And it's a complex question too because it's not just about data and data protection. It's also about competition. There's competition in law involved in this. And there's also the impact on our society. So data protection is focused on individual harms. But there's societal harms um, that we are examining right now. And I think especially we have to get a grip on this because of artificial intelligence, machine lear learning, and the Internet of Things, where a tsunami of data is, is before us, and that's why there are moral questions as well as legal <coughs> questions. Does that answer your question? No, on the statutory duty of care. Right. Statutory duty of care is, is a proposal that's being widely discussed as a basis for protecting individuals. And I think that's what a statutory duty of care does, is it, it, it's focused again on the individuals, not necessarily on societal protection. It is one way forward. I worry that um, if we put all our eggs into the statutory duty of care basket, um, that we are going to be, we're going to have to see years of litigation before we actually get to standards, community standards, and what that means. So I think. It's an open question right now, but it may be a, a way forward. Um, and then I think the next question that came to me was the, the spend, the 2.5 million pounds that we've spent so far in, in pursuit of, of Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, but also 30 other organizations that we investigated for their use of data in the political campaigning ecosystem. Largest investigation that the ICO has ever undertaken. <coughs> At one point, we had 40 investigators. We had to, for the first time, crunch through 700 terabytes of data, which is 52 billion pages um, of, of records that we seized from Cambridge Analytica. So this was a very complex investigation. What we learned from that investigation was hugely valuable because it was that case that allowed us to go to government and parliament and ask for new powers to be able to be a fit-for-purpose digital regulator. So our ability to freeze data in the cloud, to conduct no-notice inspections, for us to get streamlined warrants, we would not have been given those extra powers except for this extraordinary case, which I think is not going to be that extraordinary in the future. So I think that's the benefit. Um, that doesn't mean I'm happy with what I'm going to see as the long tail of litigation in this case because Facebook is appealing the fine that we issued again under the old regime. Those who say that that case has distracted us from the day-to-day -day complaints that we get from citizens and consumers, it hasn't because we actually are dealing with 100% more complaints than we were two years ago. 
So we are, we're crunching through those complaints. Every data protection regulator across the EU has seen a massive increase in, in the individual complaints. And one more thing is that you will see the UK ICO take a different approach to its regulatory remit because waiting for individual complaints to come in the door is not going to allow us to get ahead of those very large system-wide issues like ad tech. And our investigation into Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, and data brokers has taken us to now look at ad tech and the opacity of that system. So again, I, I think in the long term we're going to have a greater effect in protecting citizens and, and users. And now to the Brexit question. So I think there was four parts to your question. <laughs> so should I, should I jump in? I'll just jump in with Brexit. So um, since 2016, um, when I took this job, a lot of our time has been spent on thinking about Brexit, planning for different scenarios. The fortunate, I guess the fortunate um, case for us as the ICO is the government and parliament has been very clear they're going to retain and maintain GDPR as, as the law of the land. So that's given us sort of this, this centrality, this rock of certainty, which many other policy areas don't have. So the GDPR is going to be the law of the land. What is uncertain for the ICO and for UK businesses, for EU businesses and public bodies, is the, the, um, the legitimacy of data flows, of data transfers. So there's questions around no deal versus a transition period. Transition period, if we have that in the withdrawal agreement, it's basically status quo in terms of data flow as well as the UK ICO being an observer at the board. So that's the withdrawal agreement until we get to a place where there can be an assessment of adequacy. In a no deal, Brexit scenario, then other mechanisms need to be put in place for data transfers, particularly between the EU and the UK and beyond. And in a no deal situation, the ICO will not be sitting at the European Data Protection Board, so it will be outside of the one-stop shop and the consistency mechanisms. What does that mean? We'll have to cope with it through enforcement cooperation, bilateral arrangements, you know, country by country. It won't be smooth or easy, but we, we do, we have done some planning. And I think I've probably forgotten two other parts of your question. So the longer term, if we're... So sorry, it's the longer term, where might EU regulate, you've been part of sort of, you know, observing the way the EU approaches data regulation. Just wondering, in the longer term, if the UK, say, commits to, say, aligned with EU data regulation, where do you think that might go without UK influence? Uh, okay. Is it like to be much more restrictive than it might have been if we'd been part of the room? So the, 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 the ICO has been involved in writing more than 50% of the guidance on the GDPR. So we are the largest data protection authority in the EU. So we've contributed a lot to the interpretation of, of the regulation, the development of the guidelines. That said, I think the UK and, and the EU, I mean, we share the same values, um, the same values of fundamental rights for data protection. The UK has had a data protection law since 1984. So I can't see that we're going to actually back up very much from that. And if you look around the world, if you look at Canada, if you look at the US, Japan, um, the Philippines, all of these jurisdictions are actually strengthening their data protection regimes to catch up with the GDPR. So I think the GDPR is, is the gold standard that other countries are striving, striving for. So, and as um, chair of the international conference, we do have um, a front row seat. I was in India just before Christmas talking to Indian officials about their new data protection law and how to set up a regulator. So I think that the UK will continue to have influence globally. 
Thanks. Um, if we keep them short, crikey, Whoa. we're not going to get through all of these, but I will take the gentleman uh, in the front row, um, the lady next to him, and the gentleman, if we, we try and get both of you in that row in as well. And sorry for those of you we haven't been able to get around to. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, my name's Matthew Trimming. I'm the senior advisor at Public, which is uh, Europe's leading GovTech uh, venture. We're a big fan of Elizabeth and everything that she does. Um, Tom Tugan hat's letter about cost recovery. Uh, we're very supportive of, if you want to say anything on that. Your tech sandbox is brilliant, if you want to say anything on, on that as, as well. Thanks. Thank you, I love the sandbox too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm glad it's not called a sand pit. Yes. That doesn't sound good. It's an easy mistake to make. Yeah. Hi, Olivia Ward from law firm Berger Salmon. Um, I think we've already touched on it a little bit, but in the event of a no deal Brexit, uh, what steps do you think that UK controllers should be taking to legitimise their uh, transfers of data from uh, EU-based processes? Thank you. And then the two from the sort of middle row. Um, just by the camera. There. Yeah. Uh, hi, Andreas Pavli from the uh, Open Government Network and Involve. Hi. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the, uh, uh, the report that was uh, launched and to ask what you think the biggest challenges are to actually getting the recommendations that you have over the line and also in terms of the implementation of those uh, changes, what do you think are the biggest obstacles to actually getting a successful uh, implementation of it? Thank you. Nicholas Taylor, Hanover Communications. Um, I want to go back to content regulation. We've obviously got the online harms white paper coming out shortly from DCMS and the Home Office. How do you see the actions that your office is taking to the age-appropriate design code and code of practice on the use of um, data for political campaigns fitting in with the government's work streams on internet regulation? Thank you. Okay, so a question about um, no deal in a no deal situation. So we do have um, two sets of guidance on our, on our website and the European Data Protection Board has also just this week issued no deal guidance to give some um, instruction certainty to what companies need to do to um, prepare for that. And our no deal guidance, there's a set for um, government and the commercial sector and just yesterday we published no deal guidance for the law enforcement sector. Is your question very specifically about UK data controllers with EU processors? Yes. So you're asking the really tough question. <laughs> so that is the question that is being dealt with by the European Data Protection Board right now. And within, I think by the beginning of March, I know it sounds very late, there will, there will be some more certainty and an answer to that, to that question. <coughs> you could also talk to one of our, our staff and they'll give you more detail. That's a very technical question, yeah. Um, the biggest challenge, you asked about what are the, the biggest challenge to getting the recommendations in the, um, in the outsourcing report over the line. Our first step is really to get the recommendations and the report debated in Parliament. So we're, we're really pushing for that and we've got some parliamentary interest right now so we need to move that forward to get it really debated there in the House of Lords and the House of Commons. So that's the first step. Um, and again, it's getting the government to even do the things that the government can do right now under designation, section five designation <coughs> order. So by the stroke of a pen, after some consultation, contractors could be brought under F the FOI regime without legislative change. And that'll be the first step that we really push because I'm not naive there's not a lot of legislative time right now to make the kind of changes that, that we put forward, but we will continue and we will be persistent and practical in moving this forward. Um, where do we fit in in terms of the online harms paper? Where does the ICOs work on age appropriate design and what was the second part of uh, it? The code of practice on the use of data. Right. So I think both of those issues go to my point that um, whatever new regulation that there is put in place as a result of the white paper, as a result of legislative change, the ICO and data protection, the use of data, personalization is still going to be in the mix. 
And I think the age-appropriate design code is an excellent way forward to start to push on the architecture of websites and services. And I think the, looking at the architecture of these services is going to go further than just thinking about con user-generated content regulation, which is really hard. And it might end up in the very, very <coughs> difficult to do pile. Um, in terms of the code of practice for the use of data in political campaigning, that's one of the main recommendations that we came, that came out of our Democracy Disrupted report. And um, we have finished consultation on that code and, and we will have that code ready by the fall. What we're pushing for is to have that code on statutory footing so that we can enforce against it and that courts have to take it into account um, in terms of cases that, that come before them. I'm going to ask one final question before we all go. Um, Elizabeth, you mentioned you're sort of halfway through your five-year term at the moment. When you get to the end of that term, what are the three things, I mean, this, in this huge, vast array of things that you're responsible for and that the ICA is doing, what are the three things that you'd like to be remembered for having done? I'm thinking about legacy halfway through my term. Because <laughs> um, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I, I think in terms of the focus that I've been putting on the office, the first is growing the capacity of the office so that we can be a fit for purpose regulator. So that's in increased staff, but also the right kind of staff, the right kind of processes to make a difference in these large ecosystems. So that's a new way of regulating. So I think of all that as I want, to, I want people to see that the ICO has really um, stepped up to his remit and has the capacity to do its job. That's number one. Um, number two would be to get the recommendations in the outsourcing report over the line. So as I said, that's, I'm going to be very persistent and our team's going to be very persistent and look for support in, in that work because obviously we can't do it alone and there's a lot of people in the space that want to see it happen. And probably the third would be um, fairness in the use of data in political campaigning because I think that is necessary for free and fair elections and democracy. So we get used to these kind of techniques to sell us cars and, and, and vacations and trainers, but not for our politics. So we really have to get fairness in the use of data um, for political campaigning and yet still engage people in digital campaigns. So those are probably the three areas of focus. Excellent, thank you. I'm sure we could have spent an hour on each one of those and everything else uh, that you've been asked about um, today. One parish notice um, before we leave. Um, if you're interested in some of the uh, issues that were raised today, on Tuesday evening, uh, I'm in conversation with Jamie Suskind, who's written a book about future politics, which deals with how we think about all of these data digital related issues um, in politics in the years to come. Um, but all that remains for me to say now is thank you all for coming and a huge thank you to Elizabeth uh, for speaking to us today. Thank you.